So what I will try um, to tell you is a brief overview of um, sort of the uh, past, present, and future evolutionary history of SARS-CoV-2 based on our analyses, selection analysis of complete genomes. As the previous talk uh, you know, cleanly illustrated, uh, there are always uh, a lot of selective forces shaping the evolution of uh, rapidly evolving pathogens, of which SARS-CoV-2, of course, is one, not the most rapidly evolving, not even close, actually, but it's in uh, the rapidly evolving category. Um, depending on the stage uh, in which this virus exists, uh, there'll be different uh, types and different natures of selective forces, beginning with zoonoses, so transmission to a new species. And then if you think about it, transmission to a new host with a different immune environment is effectively like a marker zoonosis because the virus has to go to a slightly different environment. And you know, that is modulated by varying immune selective forces that all have different uh, signatures, you know, different rates, uh, different time periods where they manifest it. So cytotoxic T cell, linear epitopes, you have innate immunity, which is sort of more broad, and you have antibody, which is structural. Um, if you view monoclonals, for example, as a therapy for SARS-CoV-2, there's now you know, evidence of uh, you know, drug resistance development in this context. Um, Nupiravir and other drugs that are coming out will probably induce some of that. Uh, there's competition between strains uh, uh, that wish to optimize virulence and transmissibility um, at a longer time scale, which is really beyond um, you know, years, it's more in millennia, is host path pathogens arms race. Um, for example, the evolution of antiviral factors and anti-antiviral factors in viruses. Uh, the key points that I would like to emphasize is that most of the time, despite all of this, most of the viral genome is conserved. Uh, most of the observed variation that you see is expected to be neutral. Uh, and the changes that are not neutral um, are few, but important to detect early and ideally to predict. Uh, so because we have over 4 million um, genomic sequences in GISAID, and you know, rapidly accumulating over 1.3 million deep sequencing data sets in um, the sequence read archive for SARS-CoV-2, nearly every genomic position has sequences with multiple allelic variants. So here's a plot, you know, basically uh, genomic coordinates on the log scale, the y-axis, you see how many sequences have a variant at this position, um, and the cutoff line is 100 sequences. So the point of the story is basically, you know, if you want to look at variants, you can basically find almost every single imaginable uh, nucleotide mutation already sampled. Uh, if you look at distribution of these, um, what I would call allelic variants, um, I would like to distinguish allelic variants from variants because variants have now come uh, in this context to imply the entire genome, more like a lineage. So from more traditional genomics, a variant would just be a SNP. Um, so allelic variants, um, exists at a very unequal frequency distribution. So again, uh, there's a log scale on the y-axis and there's allelic variant frequency. And if you look in the tail distribution, say at 5% or greater, there's not that many mutations there. There's 100 or so, um, and they're obviously interesting because they're at high frequency and people will test them. So, you know, the D614Gs, 501Ys and all these things. Uh, the vast majority of variation exists at low frequency, less than 1%. Um, so what I would say, the less common variants, perhaps, and the you know 0.1 to 2 percent are potentially interesting and perhaps not obvious. So this would be this band, and you can see there is a you know fair number of um, sequences carrying uh, you know variants uh, in, in this allelic frequency. I mean, some of them would be rare clades, but a lot of them are repeated mutations. Uh, so there's too many of them to test exhaustively. So there are over 2,000, um, right? So you know we need to filter them down. Uh, the analytical framework that we've been using for these types of analyses uh, is comparative sequence evolution uh, with uh, the primary motivation is to find uh, key mutations that have significant phenotypic and epidemiological significance. Uh, we do this through the analysis of substitution patterns uh, using phylogenetic uh, substitution models uh, in large sets of SARS-CoV-2 data in order to identify um, genomic sites subject to selective pressure, uh, implying that they could be possibly important. Uh, so we used a, uh, a suite of stock and modified DNDS methods uh, for coding sequence evolution developed over uh, well over two decades. These are not new methods. They've been extensively used successfully in other RNA viruses in similar contexts. These methods are implemented in the HiFi software package, which my lab um, uh, has been developing for you know, quite some time. Uh, on our public servers, um, so if you want to, you can run these methods uh, uh, through a website called datamonkey.org. I've processed you know, well over 10,000 complex coronavirus evolutionary analyses from researchers worldwide, meaning that people are interested in doing this outside what we do. 
uh, as a lot of computational scientists uh, involved in sequence analysis and other contexts uh, of SARS-CoV-2 uh, effort, we've had to spend considerable effort uh, to scale up the analyses and develop data reduction te techniques to deal with these data volumes. Uh, and if you're interested in more details of all that we've uh, done, there's this um, collaborative uh, portal called COVID-19 at galaxyproject.org where all of this is cataloged. So there's a lot more work that I'm not gonna talk about. All right, so uh, let me walk you through the timeline of viral evolution. Let's go back to um, you know before the virus emerged uh, and we realized it was a problem. So you know prior to December two thousand nineteen, namely at the zoonosis and early adaptation. So all of this work um, has been a, it's it's a collaboration with uh, the David Robertson Lab, uh, the University of Glasgow, and is published in Plus Biology. Uh, and the goal, though, we wanted to address two questions. The first one was, did SARS-CoV-2 experience selective pressure during its emergence from an animal progenitor? Uh, in order to answer this question, we collected all closely related sarcoco virus sequences. Uh, and within those sequences, we defined what we call the NCOV or novel coronavirus clade of isolates uh, from bats and pangolins, including the reference SARS-CoV-2 strain. That's not very many sequences. And we focused on the selection recombination history of this clade. So there's this clade. Um, you know, the, the, some of the branches, they're not showing very well in Zoom, they're just really light gray, but the, the, the SARS-CoV-2 branch is pretty much what we're interested in doing. Um, to summarize what we found, so we found a couple of things that were not surprising. We found evidence of extensive recombination history in this clade. Uh, in fact, there's a follow-up analysis uh, uh, currently in BioArchive uh, from, again, led by David Robertson's group. Uh, that if you look at more sequences, you can not only find recombination, you can find pretty clear evidence of cold and hot spots, including some interesting locations in spike. Um, and if you look, uh, there are many recombination breakpoints. So there is a uh, chart um, from this paper. So if you look at the bottom plot, this is basically uh, a genome broken into non-recombinant fragments. So every time there's a switch, there's a recombination breakpoint. So there's in the order of 20, and depending on how you look, you can find 50, up to 60. Uh, breakpoints in, in coronavirus. So, so they recombine a lot. This is something that we'll have to look forward to um, as the virus continues to circulate. Recombination is definitely going to be a more important factor. Uh, there's, we found compelling argument for sort of genomic-wide evidence uh, of uh, uh, GC content depletion as an adaptive trait, which is just an interesting side note. I'm, gonna I'm not gonna talk about it. But to get back to my points, you know, all these black dots here, so this tick marks across the genomes, these are sites that are invariable. So even in these highly recombinant, pretty divergent strains, there's the primary signal is uh, negative selection and, co and uh, conservation. So, you know, here's the location of all the negatively selected sites. Um, sorry, why, why do I have this slide twice? Uh, and a few sites under positive selection um, in uh, the novel coronavirus clade, but not too exciting. And there's some evidence that are under selection in the um, uh, novel coronavirus clade. If you look specifically at the branch that leads to SARS-CoV-2, there's nothing there. So there's extensive evidence of selective pressure in this clade. So, you know, deeper in this clade, you know, before, uh, you know, uh, rat, uh, sorry, bat sequences and pangolin sequences. Um, so all these highlighted branches is some evidence of selection, but there's nothing leading to SARS-CoV-2, uh, which led us to conclude that SARS-CoV-2 um, is a generalist uh, virus that is adept at host switching and does not require significant immediate adaptation during zoonosis. So basically, once it got in the human population, it was happy to spread without too much change. Uh, and that was the second part of this analysis, which is you know, what happened early on. So up to October of 2020, and the evolution of SARS-CoV-2 in humans follows a mostly neutral pattern. And that's because it's spreading in naive hosts. So there's not a lot of selective pressure for the virus to do anything. And if it doesn't have to do anything, it won't. Um, so it's happy to spread pretty much as it is. Uh, there are a couple of ways to look at it. You can look at relative lack of meaningful diversity. So here's a chart that shows um, a couple of uh, sort of trend lines as you go through, the, this is all 2020, starting in April to October. So if you look at these top lines, this is basically a fraction of um, sites and spike and RDRP that have some variation. So you can see pretty rapidly, there's a lot of just noisy variation accumulating to the point where basically every site has something. But if you look at sites that are showing um, you know, any signal of selection, one, it's, it's growing at a much lower rate. This is a square root scale, so it's nonlinear, and it's actually not you know, picking up that much. So most of this variation is just noise. Um, and uh, in the analysis of about 150,000 just eight sequences, which is what, uh, you know, what was available at the time. So this is over a year ago. 
uh, only a few sites exhibit um, signal for positive selection. So I'll have I'll show a couple of these charts throughout the talk. So what this is showing again, there's a temporal axis of when the analysis was done. Uh, you know, these are now individual sites in the genome annotated by their protein um, and the uh, location within the protein and uh, the intersection of a site and a time point. If there's a bubble there, there's some evidence of positive selection. Uh, and the size of the bubble um, is proportional to this, the basically logarithm of p-value. So the bigger the um, bubble, the stronger the evidence. So a couple of things you see. So S614 and linked our DRP323 site is basically selected throughout the entire history. And that's the first one that was found. It was reported on in April of 2020. And then going up to October, there's not a whole lot of other stuff going on. There's some things come and go, but there's no sort of, other than these two sites, there's not much else going on. So we concluded that this was pretty much a neutrally evolving site. Um, so, you know, and then everything changed around Christmas of 2020 uh, because three independent lineages emerged, which all had the signature and 501Y mutation, what are now called the alpha, beta, and gamma lineages using the WHO nomenclature. And the first thing that we realized, and not just us, but a lot of people have realized, but sort of, I think we, we maybe dug a little deeper, uh, is that if you simply look at uh, all these clade defining mutations for the alpha, beta, and gamma, you know, there, there's a fair degree of overlap. So they ha all have 501Y, you know, two of them share 417, two of them share, you know, 484K, all of them share this deletion uh, in, in, in NSB6. So, you know, this, this prompted us to say, these are independently of old lineages. They all arose in different countries. They sort of all had slightly different mechanisms uh, uh, of how they came to be. So, you know, what's driving their evolution that seemed to be probing the same set of sites. So we set out to perform detailed analyses of, uh, you know, now over 2 million just eight sequences to identify where and how convergent evolution may be operating. And this is all published in, in, in a recent cell paper that was led by uh, um, uh, Darren Martin um, out of University of Cape Town. Uh, and because cell makes you put together these nice author summaries, I'm just going to follow through them because it's sort of a great pictorial summary of what we've done. So imagine this is a site, um, some abstract sites and protein that has uh, each, each bubble is a sequence, and within that bubble is the amino acid that that sequence carries. So there's some variability pre-November 2020, but it's too weak to trigger a positive selection signal. So, you know, there's, there's nothing going on pre-November 2020. Then in November 2020, an excess of independent mutations that are now showing in different colors, <clears throat> an independent meaning phylogenetically independent, that change the encoded amino acid at the site, trigger a positive selection signal. Now, subsets of these mutations go on uh, to seed individual lineages. So you have alpha, beta, and gamma lineages. And it is apparent, for example, that um, you know, K uh, is favored over E, if you think of this as a 484 site, at, at two of the lineages. Um, so another way to look at this is you can do um, sort of very broad level characterization of selective pressure, uh, which again, you look at the analysis date um, here. Um, so this is uh, you know, uh, uh, basically looking at sliding windows, three months increments, uh, so November 2020 would have included sequences from August, um, so from um, September, um, no, August, September, and October 2020, and then you uh, compute this quantity, which sort of roughly corresponds to what we call selective pressure or selective force, which is the number of positively selected sites normalized by the kilobase of the gene and normalized by the tree length to sort of standardize the fact that you have different numbers of sequences sampled at different times. But in November 2020, you can see that there is this. Uh, like especially if you, for example, follow spike, which is the orange line, there is an increase, a dramatic increase in the selective pressure, uh, uh, which indicates that there's a qualitative change in what's going on with these genes. Uh, and here's another plot of this bubble variety, which, which we've seen before. Uh, again, time on the uh, x-axis, individual sites. So these sites are the combination of all signature defining, uh, lineage defining mutations, or what we call signature mutations of alpha, beta, and gamma. So these, this is the union of all the, sites uh, which were uh, used to define alpha, beta, and gamma. Uh, and you can see this selective profile, the gray line is uh, November or December 2020. So this is using sequences up to December 2020. And the interesting point here is that many of these clade defining mutations were detectably selected before they became clade defining. So for example, you know, site 501, you know, was detected on, you know, full month before anybody realized what it was a thing. 681, 
uh, which, which also became you know, fairly dominant, was uh, detected before that. You have these accessory 5 and 18 and so on. So just keep that in mind that selection analysis seem to have a little bit of a lead time. So they can detect things before they rise in, rise in frequency and be, before you start looking at sweeping lineages. Um, so in March 2021, going back to the analysis, uh, so E to K associated positive selection is only detected within a clay that hasn't fully fixed it. Uh, right, so here it's now fixed, but now the, the idea is that perhaps the alpha lineage is sort of probing to see if it wants to go into that direction. Um, and then, um, so we use data up to February uh, of 2021 to identify and define 34 potentially convergent sites between these three lineages. Um, you know, and this is what it would look like. For example, if you look at site 18, you know, you see that all three lineages, uh, you know, uh, substitute to F away from the consensus uh, from the reference position, uh, there's further um, you know, evidence of positive selection in V3, right? So um, you, know, you can basically you know, go through a list of candidate sites to find some criteria of what constitutes convergent mutations, and you will come up with um, you know, the list of 34 sites that we had. Uh, and then we used follow-up data sets from February to June to validate if this is any way useful. Um, and uh, basically what we said is like, we we're predicting that this site uh, uh, is convergent in some sense. There should be an increase in frequency in this site. So in total, 2047 of the analyzed convergent mutations that were suggested by analysis uh, more than doubled in frequency in at least one of the lineages between the 15th of March and June of uh, uh, first. And you can put statistical tests on it and this all comes back significant. Um, and you can uh, sort of zoom in uh, uh, what's going on with specific uh, 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 sort of, if the sequences are converging, you can basically take um, uh, a feature that says how many of these uh, 34 lineage defining sites, or in this particular uh, case, I'm looking just at spike, I think there's 16 sites in spike. Uh, how many um, uh, uh, of these mutations are matched by say all the V3, which is the gamma lineage sequences. So you see this dominant mode here, um, sorry. Um, just, uh, hey, there we go. The dominant mode here is nine. So, you know, nine uh, is what most sequences match, but there's this, you know, there's, there's, sequences with 10 and 11 uh, mutations that, that have um, you know, arisen in frequency. So you're actually picking up some additional mutations and you can look uh, to see what they are, but that's not particularly important to understand the details. So we basically can track to see which sequences are the closest to these predicted signature mutations. Uh, but of course, you know, uh, uh, there's this great Yiddish saying that you know, man plans and God laughs because this was all great until in the summer of 2021, you know, Delta took over. So on all the N501 lineages basically have been supplanted. Um, and Delta is sort of what we would call is, is a member of the S452 lineages, which appear to be in a different fitness peak compared to the uh, uh, 501 lineages. Now the question is, are meta signature dead? Eh, it's not, not entirely certain yet. Um, so one of the, um, you, you can look say at the B6, B1617 mutation uh, lineages, by the way, um, uh, all of my slides, I'll, I'll post a link in the chat. You know, you can, you can look at the slides and links like here that you see, uh, these are all two interactive notebooks that you can go on and just explore the data on your own. So all of these are just screenshots from our, um, you know, public facing uh, 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 tool. So you can go and play with the data on your own. Um, so for example, if you look at um, B1672, uh, most of the sequences, so one or two uh, matches to our um, signature, but there's actually, uh, you know, 46 sequences that have six mutations that are matching. And here's the signature. So they have this NSV 285i, deletion and 107, deletion 144, you know, or 3A and 2015Y. So there's, there's still some, <clears throat> uh, uh, these sites still keep coming up in, in other lineages. Um, so when the Delta takes over, uh, most of the sequences in Delta have one, uh, sig one match to our signature and spike. But there's actually, so this is the mode and this is the 681R, but it many acquired another mutation. So for example, in addition to this, they have 138H, which was defined by our analysis, excluding Delta. And it, some sequences have actually acquired three, four or five additional mutations, including things that they, they definitely, they're either misclassified uh, uh, by Pangolin as Delta confidently, or they've picked up things that look like 501Y mutations, like the 6970 deletion, which is a common uh, occurrence. You know, one of them even has the 501Y mutation. So we'll have to wait and see. Now, moving forward, so obviously Delta is in the last word in this pandemic. Um, it's going to continue doing things. 
Um, so our uh, uh, next goal is can comparative analysis help prioritize genomic variants and location of variation in, in, in the genomes that are important in some sense. Uh, and you know, that's up to you how you define this. You know, mostly for epidemiological tracking, well, what seems to be happening is people see, you know, follow mutations which increase in frequency, and if they increase in frequency enough, then they go and test them to see if there's anything going on. Um, are they involved in adaptation and show in some sense unexpected evolutionary patterns? Um, so as I mentioned before, selection analysis seem to have the ability to pick up selective signals before they sweep up in frequency uh, or become variants of interest or variants of concern. So for example, here's the selection at, um, just to show you and the delta uh, uh, signature defining uh, uh, positions. So there's a lot of signal you know, before summer when it actually took, uh, took off. Um, this is also an interactive notebook that you can see. This is sort of a selective force uh, uh, based on live data. Um, so this temporal evolution of selection force defined as the number of positively selected sites normalized by kilobase of gene length and the internal tree length. And this quality should be directly comparable between genes and time points. So I'm showing N and S. And it's great that N came up as, an, as, as another important gene, that not just S, it's happening. So as this red line goes up, it sort of indicates an increase in selective forces. So on S, there's a, a spike around October 2020. So the, and, and then it sort of stays on, tails off, and not starting picking up again. And in N, it's even more dramatic. So actually, if you look at selective force, S is not the most uh, um, sort of driven gene. Um, actually, uh, it's, I think, the fifth most driven gene uh, by, by this metric. Um, uh, and if you look at the evolution of our uh, cell paper metasignature sites, you know, all the way up to October, there's still, you know, uh, it's dropping off, but there's still evidence of selection operating at um, pretty much all of those sites, with the exception of things like Healy case 47, which is actually negatively selected by showing it's blue. Uh, we have, we, we've put together these nice sort of, this is an at the glance summary of what's going on now. Again, you can go and click it uh, and, and play with it yourself. So this is our view of what's going on in, uh, in, in uh, the genome now. So there's at the moment 312 positively selected sites used you know, from August to uh, basically present day. Um, you know, uh, Actually compared to the previous period, a lot of sites dropped off. So 169 sites that used to be selected are no longer selected. You know, 49 got added and you can see the distribution of where they are. Uh, and again, there's, um, there's a lot of negatively selected sites and you can sort of look for red dots to see where they spread throughout the genome and there's some in spike, but they're scattered all the way throughout. There's actually a lot of stuff going on in NSP too. Don't know why. Um, so, uh, you know, sites with new or strongest recent signal of selection are here. Again, you can go explore them if you want to see, you know, if any particular site you think is interesting, is there any evidence uh, at the global data analysis, there's selective pressure in it, including sites like uh, S112, which show this interesting toggling pattern, which means that they were initially negatively selected, shown by these blue dots, then nothing, and then they became positively selected, so basically switched uh, at that position. Um, so um, to sort of conclude, I'm going to give you two more uh, um, uh, sort of sources to get the information from. So we can use the evolutionary history uh, before SARS-CoV-2 and related sarbacoviruses to basically predict which codons and amino acids are expected in uh, the same position in SARS-CoV-2. Our evolutionary models uses fairly complicated uh, uh, substitution models that allow site-level biochemical property importance to impute evolutionary credibility. But intuitively, all you're doing is like, look, look the evolution at site 484 and spike. Here's a fragment of the sarbacovirus tree. This green sequence is uh, the consensus of SARS-CoV-2. And basically what we want to do, we want to say, you know, given this uh, evolutionary context that you see S's, E's, P's, and all of that in a specific distance from the tree, uh, uh, can you predict which of these residues are likely uh, to occur in, um, at, at uh, a site 484 and uh, SARS-CoV-2? And you basically get a distribution of um, predicted frequencies, including, for example, K, which uh, is what actually ended up occurring there. But it was, you know, you can predict K as likely uh, based on the evolution of sarbacoviruses. There's another um, sort of summary. Uh, uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but we have a whole um, you know, other way to look at this from the perspective of what's predicted, what's not. I'm going to call out the fact that at the moment, there's 100, uh, almost 1,500 sites that have um, unpredicted variants occurring in uh, more than one in 10,000 sequences. So this is sort of the set of unusual changes compared to uh, NCOV2. But still, this is a, a small, most of the variation that you see in the SARS-CoV-2 genome is entirely predictable based on this past evolution, but these are sort of interesting things uh, that are not. And finally, um, 
Um, you know, this is uh, also currently in preprint form. Uh, this is a collaborative work with, uh, you know, Vera Biotechnology uh, uh, and, and, and a lot of other folks, which asks, can we predict short-term evolutionary dynamics of the virus? So the idea is that basically you take data up to today and you try to predict it one month ahead, two months ahead, and three months ahead. And by predict, I mean, tell me which mutations are likely to increase in frequency uh, based on some, uh, um, you know, well-defined uh, measures. Turns out we can reliably detect sizable substantial increase in frequency the next three months with a really good, uh, you know, machine learning performance area under the curve of 0.9. Uh, so here's a small um, indication of how it works. So these are all the variants. This is all retrospective analysis now. But when we did it, you can basically see that you detect things like E484K, 482, uh, 452R, 94P, way before the takeoff in frequency. So the ticks is when they were detected, and this is the actual prevalence. So this method is very sensitive to finding variants that are going to increase in frequency before they increase in frequency. And the beautiful thing about it, it works based on very, very simple metrics. So one of the things that seems to be very predictive is evidence of positive selection, which I've talked about. But the other one is even simple. It's a scalar measure based on epidemiological data, which is you take a mutation and you see how many unique genomic backgrounds it occurs in. Uh, and you compute that as a, you rank it, and mutations that tend to tolerate a lot of genomic backgrounds are the ones that will grow out in frequency. So you, it's sort of a useful proxy for mutations that recur in multiple lineages. Um, so, um, you know, and, and we can prioritize a mutation as adaptive or conserved based on a simple combination of factors. So selective past and present, evolutionary credibility, and this haplotype factor. And here's again, a notebook where we have my list of uh, you know, mutations that we think are the most interesting based on this A score. Again, if you just sort of glance over it, you see that uh, you know, most of the mutations are actually not from spike. So there's a whole lot of N, you know, there are all these you know, helicase exonuclease and other genes, which you can look at uh, and investigate. So again, you may it'd be interested in using these tools if you just have a particular mutation you want to inquire to see if it's interesting in any sense. So looking forward, um, we're, we're thinking of developing, uh, you know, improving our prediction of near-term evolutionary trajectories, and, you know, developing uh, and validating uh, uh, techniques for prioritization of low-frequency sites and important combinations of sites. So I haven't talked about that at all, but mutations have preference for occurring in the context of other mutations. Um, we're looking uh, at intra-host adaptation using deep sequencing data set, which I have data sets, which I also haven't talked about because mutations that eventually become fixed in the population have to arise in some individual. So that's sort of the cauldron where the evolutionary uh, diversity is being stirred. Um, so we're, we're starting to look at analysis of selective force associated with vaccine breakthrough infections. Um, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of good public data that's annotated well uh, to allow this. Um, so if anybody you know, has any interest in doing these analyses and, and has uh, data, please reach out to me. Um, and we're also, we're looking at the development of additional meta signatures for Delta and emergent lineages, uh, and fundamentally better prediction of phenotype from genotype. As I mentioned there, uh, I, I mentioned just a small number of collaborators from multiple institutions. Uh, this was all enabled by a large, uh, uh, um, a group of uh, a large computational consortium, uh, you know, Galaxy team, GISAID, of course, for providing data. And thank you all very much for um, listening. I'm happy to take questions. Sergey, thank you very much. Beautiful story. Yeah, it's amazing to be able to catch them early as you do um, before they take over just by, you know, I guess basically the independent appearance of those, uh, you know, in multiple lineages, a neat, neat. I, I guess also it's terrifying as an experimental person to think that you've basically thrown the gauntlet down to us to figure out what all of these do. And, and uh, you know, it's in, you cite how many can be handled and I, I am with you on uh, how much work will have to come to understand what those mutants are doing. Anyway. Yeah, our goal is to make your job easier. Because <laughs> at the end of the day, I mean, predictions are just that. I mean, it tells you nice stories and shows p-values and trends, but you got to go and, you know, show mechanistically what does this thing do. So, um, so we have our work cut out for us. Thank you. All right. All right. Andy, did you, you have your hand up? Yeah. Uh, two questions. Is there any evidence that the original uh, SARS-CoV-2 came from a lab or from nature, and in retrospect, could you have used AI to uh, design a better vaccines? Oh, they're very different questions. Um, so my answer to the first one um, is sort of a cop-out because you can never use sequence data alone 
to definitively establish origin. I mean, and, and uh, what I would you know quote here is, there's never been a successful court case where sequence data were used to prove HIV transmission, for example. You can always come up with alternative explanations. So um, uh, there, there is, uh, I don't think this will be settled by uh, sequence analysis. Uh, and as far as AI, um, I mean, for one thing, people have used AI. I mean, everything has been thrown at it. Uh, but AI works really well uh, if you can define a large data set with a well-defined quality criterion. So what, what is the desired outcome? And, and, and going back to sort of the history of vaccine development for these recalcitrant pathogens like you know, HIV and influenza, viral diversity and lack of good understanding of what uh, constitutes a correlate of protective immunity it hasn't been solved. Right. So if we gave the AI a bunch of training data and said, we want this, right? You know, this is a good vaccine, this is a bad vaccine. Give me, you know, millions upon millions of realizations to learn it. We don't have these data. I mean, we basically have uh, a couple of data points. So AI is not a good uh, um, tool for this uh, setting, as far as I understand it. I mean, uh, I'm sure somebody will figure out uh, a better application. But, um, but moving forward, I think that's definitely something we should be doing uh, as, you know, uh, the rational design of uh, immunogens. Um, Eric, you have your hand up. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, Sergey, I have a quick question. Is there any evidence for recombination breakpoints in any um, SARS-CoV-2 from human isolates? And if yes, not, there is. why not? Yeah, yeah, yeah there is, there is. It, it, it's, it's still somewhat limited, so there were, um, there a couple of lines of evidence. There was a um, study done by Andrew Rambo and his colleagues in the UK, which they used, uh, you know, phylogenetic uh, methods to show that there are some recombinant lineages that are spreading in the UK. Um, and uh, you know, from this, this isn't published yet, but we definitely have, you know, very clean, uh, you know, data from um, intrahost uh, multiple infection cases where recombination occurs. So my current gut feeling is that based on what we know about SARS-CoV-2 is that if you have multiple infection with any host, recombination will happen in that host. I mean, it just, it's just a fact of life. That virus loves to recombine. Uh, so the question is, you know, how long do we have to wait before this recombinant uh, get, gains a significant uh, selective advantage over what's around it uh, to start, uh, you know, taking over? Um, and I, I think it'll happen. Um, I don't think it'll happen immediately, mostly because there's not that many, I mean, what you need for this to happen is you need to have multiple lineages that can recombine to, the recombinant has to be better, you know, in some sense than the, uh, uh, any of the constituent strains. And I don't think there's any evidence for that because again, at the moment, Delta doesn't have to do much. It seems to be happy spreading around. So, you know, if the virus is, if, if the virus is near a fitness peak, it'll stay there until the fitness landscape shifts. But there's, it's definitely there and it's gonna become more and more extensive. Um, it's, you know, just the question of when.